Um, okay, welcome uh, everybody to this uh, webinar. Is there a new red green tide in Latin America? It's organized by Global Justice Now, um, who most of you I'm sure will know. Um, it, we're a campaigning organization um, working to put people before profit in the global economy. Um, my name's James. I run um, Global Justice Now's activism team, which supports the, the organizing and the campaign work of all our local groups around the country, um, including our youth network. Um, and part of that support involves political education as well, in which spirit um, we've organized this, this webinar. And, and I'm very pleased um, to have three fantastic speakers all um, in Latin America, from Latin America, in Latin America now, um, to talk to us about this kind of very, these very important developments. Tatiana Garavito, Yasna Tapia Cisneros, and Cassia Bichara. I'll introduce them more properly in a minute, um, but just first to say a word about the topic. Um, the red green tide from our title is, is, is again, as some of you may know, a reference to the pink tide of Latin America, of left wing um, governments, which kind of swept Latin America two decades ago. Um, this week, we've seen one of those presidents from that pink tide, um, Luis Ignacio da Silva, or Lula, as he's known in Brazil, take a step towards returning to power in the first round of the presidential election uh, there in Brazil, where he beat the disastrous hard right populist Bolsonaro um, by, by five million votes. Um, we'll come to that a bit later on. But generally speaking, this the kind of new wave of socialists isn't really about the past returning, mostly. Um, either in terms of the people who are being elected or the exact politics, which I think in some cases at least is, is possibly more ecological than, than in the first um, pink tide and certainly shaped by the political and economic developments and the, the movement responses of the last decade. So we're not going to be able to cover it all in detail, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to draw out some parallels, even with those experiences where we, we, you know, we've not got specific speakers to cover, um, to cover, to cover those countries, um, and you know, in the meantime, focus it on those, it, on on I think the particularly interesting experiences of, of Chile, of Colombia, and of Brazil. Um, but just to say, I mean, you know, we've got of the things that have happened recently, um, Luis Arce. Um, was was elected in Bolivia, putting an end to a kind of short lived um, kind of messy right wing coup um, that happened um, uh, in in Bolivia at the end of a long uh, run by the the, the previous uh, movement for socialism president. Um, we've had Giamara Castro. Um, elected in Honduras, finally putting an end to the kind of coup regime that, that came in in 2009 when her husband actually was removed from power. Um, and also Pedro Castillo uh, elected in Peru and a little earlier than that, um, Obrador elected in Mexico, all with their own peculiarities and, 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 and particular um, strands of kind of uh, um, politics. Um, so maybe some of those things will come up, um, but um, let me now start by just introducing our speakers and then we'll jump straight in to hearing from them. First of all, we'll hear from Yasna Tapia Cisternas, who is um, a councillor um, in the commune of um, Santiago uh, in Chile. She's an eco-feminist and a member of the Commons Party, which is um, a part of the, uh, the broad front 
um, political coalition, um, which uh, uh, the president, uh, Gabriel Boric, is part of. Um, Yasna is also part of the movement for water um, that has been promoting the rights of nature um, and water and territories in the um, constitutional process, which um, we'll cover a bit as well. Um, we'll then hear from Kat Tatiana Garavito, who's a Colombian facilitator and organizer working on the intersections of race, gender and climate justice. Um, she's partly based in Colombia, partly uh, where she's speaking from us uh, from today um, in the northwest of Colombia. Um, but she's also um, partly based in the UK, where she's affiliated with various organizations, including the climate justice organization Tipping Point, um, well, and the climate justice organization Wretches of the Earth, uh, and, and, uh, and others. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from Cassia Bachara, who's a member of the International Relations Collective of the, uh, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, which is one of the biggest social movements uh, in the world, really. Um, the, the, the MST and its Portuguese initials was formed at the height of the struggle against the Brazilian military regime, um, the late 70s and early 80s. Also the period which the workers, you know, Lula's Workers' Party came out of. Um, and there are um, historic links between the two organizations, um, although also um, disagreements, I'm sure. Um, and the, the MST, for those who don't know, has used land occupations to win huge amounts of land redistribution for hundreds of thousands of people um, as it organizes for a new food system based on agroecology and food sovereignty. Um, so those are our speakers. I've introduced them all um, at the beginning so we can have um, a good interchange. Um, but I, I'm hoping now that Yasna is going to um, kick, kick us off with a bit of a um, discussion of what's going, going on in Chile. I, I think we've just had the constitutional referendum, which didn't go as perhaps we would have liked. Um, but Yasna, perhaps you can just explain. So it's, I mean, it was actually last year now when, when Boric was, was elected. He's but it, it was off the back of a period of quite intense struggle, right, uh, against um, uh, Chile's kind of quite neoliberal economy. Um, and, you know, he's not come from a kind of the a kind of the traditional center left parties. He's come from quite a different from the student movement, but from a, a, a new set of of um, of 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 left parties that have, that has grown up through that that process of struggle, perhaps for the last ten years. So, do you want to just explain some of that to us and um, bring us, you know, up to um, his election and um, what's happened since? Thank you, James. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, webinar. Um, I am excuse me. I'm still learning English. Maybe if I don't uh, can say something. Uh, properly, <laughs> I don't speak very well, so I can hope you understand my ideas, uh, what I'm talking about today. Um, for this government, uh, this current uh, government uh, was a really uh, long process, really. Um, if, if we uh, put to analyze uh, different um, reasons why come here in this moment, and to have a, a young government, uh, government by young people, <laughs> as now um, we had to we, we have to take uh, back so many years for uh, from the um, student movement from uh, a so social movement in general uh, the feminist movement uh, like how this uh, movement uh, construct agenda uh, construct uh, some politics um, and how this movement uh, construct the certainly way to see uh, how we need in the new governments uh, to to talk about about progress in Latin America, for example. Um, 
we yeah we have a struggle in this uh, last year uh, related by the um, constitutional process we have in in our country and um, but it started not just in uh, 2019 uh, when we have the 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 social outbreak or how we call it estallido social um it's not a start uh, in in this year like three years ago don't don't start uh, in this point um it start very long time ago like uh, 30 years and even the people says uh, the 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 beginning of the problems uh, was um, not for the 13 um, pesos or cash for example uh, they they want to grow the, the the cost of the transport public uh, not it's just the the start of the problems uh, it's not a 20 year uh, 30 years of uh, social problems uh, uh, before of the dictadura, before of the um, the civil uh, dictadura, I don't know how to say. Um, how? Dictatorship. Thank you. Dictatorship. Uh, we have one in seventy seventies. Um, they start before of that. They start when the democracy come back and we uh, begin is a uh, rebuilt how we thought for example about the um, education about the uh, sexual uh, rights uh, about the environments uh, guarantees conservation for example and all of these movements constructs um, that way to think the elaborate politics and this is a uh, explode <laughs> in uh, 2019 in, the, in this process, uh, we um, already uh, start uh, a new way to see the left uh, or the left politic for for say. Um, in was uh, th this was um, Frente Amplio, or oh, this was my my uh, my part. Uh, I am part of that, and the government is part of that. Um, and uh, we can uh, we uh, construct the, the possibility of the Gabriel Boric uh, was our president um, in this construction of the new way to see uh, the, the progress, the Latin progress. So um, now we have a, a, a government is a recognized public, public recognized like feminist government. Uh, recognizes uh, as uh, ecological government, uh, recognizes us to a social right government to impose politics uh, and left behind, for example, politics to to um, uh, politics um, cercano. I don't I don't have to a uh, close politics uh, of um, neoliberalism, for example. We don't think it is uh, this is the way, and we have already. 30 years of neoliberalism politic, and we want to construct another alternative of that, another alternative of extractivism, for example, another alternative to see the um, the rights uh, not like a service of the state, or like um, you uh, you can uh, go to the, a school, better school, or have better better health if you have more money. Uh, that is already happening in this in this country uh, to change that that idea to um, um, have uh, for the constitution uh, the guarantee of these uh, social rights and also uh, more um, skills or more capacity um, for for the conservation of the nature in our country, uh, because in many years, the communities and organization um, do really f uh, can do really few for a uh, defense uh, their lands, defense their own territory. Um, when they impact a some for some big uh, company, for example, 
So this is part of the, uh, the fight, uh, uh, the capi more possibility to have <laughs> uh, the capacity of project our um, communities. And every time the one community have to uh, want to protect that, um, the constitution is, uh, is um, a limit for do that. Um, but in this process, uh, we, uh, we advance very much. Uh, we have a const uh, ecological constitution, for example, an ecological, uh, what recognize the, na uh, the nature rights, uh, recognize, for example, the, the water is uh, not a property, it's not a private property, it is um, a, it's, it's not like, the concept is inappropriabilidad. <laughs> I don't know how to say in English, but it's not uh, capable to be appropriate, uh, to be appropriate, private property. Um, and this is very, very new for us because uh, we have a, a 300 and uh, comunas, uh, commun comunas, and uh, approximately, um, approach like uh, 15, 15 comunas don't have water. Don't have, uh, they can, they, they need to have water by um, pay of this water. So this is uh, one of the most bigger change uh, we can do in our constitution, but um, uh, badly of the word for us, um, we, we, uh, we failed. <laughs> The country in general uh, refused of the new text. Um, it was very difficult and hard for us uh, to lose this war, uh, this uh, fight, um, to lose uh, this opportunity to change our constitution and really uh, have this uh, advance. Now the government. Um, has the compromise uh, to another constitutional process, uh, but it's uh, certainly a not a process uh, so um, link or um, being vinculated uh, with the organizations. Uh, it's a new process to very, very far, very distance of the, the organization and the people in general. And we see uh, of, the, of the progress, um, um, part of the political national, uh, we see it uh, like um, uh, possible to be an, another process. Uh, we don't like this uh, new process, for example. I don't know how to say. Um, can I just can I just clarify mm -hmm. some of the, the 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 process here? Because uh, as I understand it, the the constitutional the coming up with a new constitution was something that's. I mean, it's not. It wasn't a project of the new government per se. Mm -hmm. In fact, it, it predated that, right? Like the the there was the 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 social explosion of, of twenty nineteen. There was you know ongoing massive protests. Um, huge police repression as well, but part of the compromise of ending that was a was a constitutional process to rewrite the constitution, which mm -hmm. previously had been the constitution of Pinochet, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, and in order to do that, and and people approved that that was uh, having a new constitution was approved by a big majority originally, right? And then there was a, an, as, an assembly elected specifically in order to write that constitution. Um, so again, people elected that assembly. Um, but then here we are, um, you know, just be, the beginning of September, the constitution, oh, which yes. was very long and detailed, um, which, which they wrote was ended up being rejected. Um, and there's been, you know, maybe I don't, I don't know if you've got some thoughts on why it was that that was rejected, or mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it seems likely, you know, there was a lot of scare stories about it and and, and false, um, false well, stories a lot about of, a, lo a lot of fake news. Um, yeah. 
um, we all have the 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 diagnosis uh, of a. We have to talk about with people um, they're outside of the um, uh, progressives, uh, political or progressive society, for example. Uh, we uh, have to talk about people doesn't understand what is feminism, for example. We have to talk about uh, with people who doesn't understand what is the, um, for example, the nature rights. Um, we our mistake uh, was talk about the the people already know that but a lot of people don't know about that don't know about this concept don't know about this uh, politics don't know about this uh, like a concept um, they use it uh, currently every day um, it, it's not that real it's not their reality uh, that was our mistake or yeah, another yeah, another uh, thing it was um, a very very important to this process where was the impact of fake news uh, impact for example the pe people maybe uh, if they approve this this new constitution uh, maybe lose their home uh, maybe can uh, lost uh, their their provis uh, provisional pension for example uh, the secure secure provisional um, and that uh, is Ontario and, and a stride and lie. Uh, but uh, we know not just for the Chilean process, you know, but for, for example, the United States process of election uh, with Trump, their fake news, uh, they have impact on the, the election, they have impact of the public opinion. Um, and we don't, uh, we uh, doesn't have a in this time, the the, the capacity the, the cap the ca capacity of um, uh, say the instill or um, say what is the truth about the new constitution. Uh, we uh, do door and door, house a house. Uh, we talk a lot in in meetings, but it doesn't um, uh, enough. Uh, uh, for the, the the common sense of the new constitution, we thought uh, this we uh, maybe uh, could change the opinion, but just we have uh, three months or one and a half year mm -hmm. to change all of that uh, common sense. But they have already thirty years <laughs> of lie, thirty years of um, assisting. Um, um, neoliberal system uh, in education thought even so it is a really um, asymmetric fight it was a really asymmetric fight uh, that was the, the big um, uh, causes of this uh, where we lose uh, this 4th of september but we have already a hope in this process and the new process but uh, we know um, this new process um, will be more uh, difficult, uh, will be more uh, um, hard, I don't know how to say, yeah. hardly, like the before process. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps I can just move us on, so, um, uh, and we'll, we'll I'm, I think we'll come back to some of the themes that you've been talking about, Yasna. It, Tatiana, um, more recently in, in Colombia, we, we had the election of actually the first ever uh left-wing president of colombia um and again with a strong environmentalist theme um in the in the in the campaigning and um and in his choice of vice presidential running mates and, and 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 what have you so do you want to do you want to tell us but also the same kind of social explosion in some ways in the in the background there so um yeah please yeah, thank you, James, and thanks um, everybody for being part of this conversation. Um, like, it's really, really nice to see people in the UK interested in Latin American politics and the politics of uh, places around the world. Um, so, yeah, I'm connecting from Colombia, from the land of the Pijao people. And yes, so I'm actually like really, really happy to be talking about uh, the recent election in Colombia because I just couldn't believe it in a way 
the day of the election, the 19th of June, um, people were celebrating in the streets, people were crying, uh, the neighborhoods like, you know, were up partying, but not the usual neighborhoods. And, uh, and it was really nice to be here. I've lived in the UK for like 17 years and I decided to be here for, you know, some time. Uh, also to see what was going to happen around this election. So to see the kinds of neighborhoods and to see the people that were celebrating uh, on the streets was, you know, very, very lovely to see. Uh, and as you said, this is like, you know, an election that, um, a, that is possible after 214 years. Uh, for the first time, Colombia elected a left-wing uh, government headed by Gustavo Petro, that you might have heard of, who is an economist, uh, uh, the former mayor of Bogota, the capital city of Colombia, but he's also a, an ex-guerrilla member of the uh, 19 movement that demobilized in the 80s. Um, so this was the person that won after you know, Colombia went through, uh, you know, a peace process that we, you know, lost uh, a few years ago uh, and that ha that has had, you know, like the ideas that, you know, or ideas around the guerrillas and, you know, a lot of debate around it, like in the public sphere. So um, that's our new, you know, uh, president. And not only that, we also have uh, his running mate, Francia Marquez, uh, who is an environmentalist lawyer who won the Goldman Prize that you might, some of you might know in 2018. Um, her climate work, it's like, it has been, it's very well known in Colombia. Uh, and she's also the first Afro-Colombian uh, vice president. So together, I think the coalition that they are part of, which is called the Pacto Historico, the Historical Pact, uh, you know, really comes from um, a history of, you know, very, very diverse movements and organizations. And I think that in itself is a massive win for, um, yeah, for, for Colombian politics in this place. But not only that, <laughs> for the first time, um, the communities that Francia Marquez in, in her campaign uh, talked or called the nadies, the nobodies. So the ones that politicians, politicians and the you know big um, political elites are not interested, were for the first time the protagonists in this election of the new government. So this was you know women, indigenous communities, Afro Colombians, the LGBTQI plus community work in class, disabled people, you know, community, communities that have been historically impacted by state violence and environmental destruction all went out to vote because of, you know, what they saw uh, and also because of the ideas that were presented as the visions for a new way of doing politics in Colombia. So, um, yeah. Um, for you know those that have been following the uh, Colombian politics a bit closely, the department where the peace agreement uh, lost was the same, um, where the same areas where you know this uh, 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 pacto historico, uh, this you know this election kind of like lost as well. Uh, so it's like it's really interesting to see that in like the big cities, in some of the big cities like Medellin, uh, um, you know, people are still kind of like stuck in these ways of uh, of working and very far right sometimes uh, politics. So yeah, that's just to be give you a little context of like how this happened. And I think James, as you were saying, uh, this also comes from um, you know national strikes that took place at the end of last year uh, for about two months people especially young people uh, were in the streets uh, fighting against attacks um, uh, increment that the government were imposing especially on young people and they were they were in the streets for you know months and the way they you know they talk about the struggles and because it was like very grassroots I think a lot of people in Colombia was able to connect to the ideas and the calls and the demands of these uh, young people and people in general that were in the streets um, and so like I think you know this uh, history 
um, he, or this historic election comes uh, from, you know, from, from some of those big uh, moments. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that in terms of the national strikes, but there were like lots of amazing things coming from that, uh, from there. But yeah, so like in terms of the uh, the the challenges of the new government, uh, of course, like they're huge. Um, we still live in a country that, you know, despite the peace agreements, as I said, continues to be one of the most dangerous places for human rights and environmental defenders worldwide. Um, and this is, you know, um, also, you know, well, it's a big challenge that, that the government is going to have to face to really make sure that the peace agreement uh, gets implemented because the previous government uh, had like four years, um, uh, you know, to sort of like implement the peace agreement, but they were not interested at all in what had uh, been agreed in that peace accord. Uh, so the new government has this like new kind of like, um, well, uh, a challenge and and the task of really making sure that, that that peace accord is implemented, but not just to make sure that the rights uh, and the lives of human rights defenders and environmental defenders and people, you know, are protected, but really to making sure that we change the conditions that allow for those uh, uh, for those for that violence to really take place in Colombia. Um, so yeah, um, I guess like the other thing to say is that like for us in Colombia and I think for Latin America, this this uh, nonetheless is a really historic moment because it transforms the political space. Um, so I think like we can all agree that like, you know, seeing uh, Pink Tide or like all of these kind of like countries in Latin America changing the way they do politics and like really basing their politics in a politics of love or care and repair, uh, really changing changes the, uh, the possibility of sustained uh, change. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like, I hope that like people that are watching from, from the UK can see, um, you know, that sometimes regions and countries can have like, you know, dictators, uh, or yeah, like really, you know, oppressive governments like the one in the UK, but that movements and people on the ground are, uh, have the chance to change things for the better. Uh, especially when there are, you know, communities that have been at re the receiving end that are the ones that can, can lead, um, you know, the change with their demands and their calls and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, like maybe I can leave it there. There are a couple of things that I would like to share maybe like later around the messaging. And I think uh, we were just discussing that about Chile, how... Um, you know, what were some of the narratives that were present for this election uh, or during this election, uh, both from the right and from the left? Uh, what are some of the things that, you know, this government did so well to be able to sort of like uh, invite people to, to, to dream and to see things differently? Uh, because I feel like in a way, all of us know the things that are not right, that are not working um, for our, you know, for our communities, for, uh, for our towns, uh, for ourselves. But it's like, how do we speak about those, uh, those needs and those visions that really kind of like help connect people? And I think that worked really well in Colombia. So I'll, yeah, I'd like to share maybe later how that came about. And I think James, you were also talking about the, um, the, the climate agenda that the government, um, has been, you know, sort of like talking about, which is, I think, yeah, like uh, a very progressive agenda for a government. Uh, like, you know, it is really nice to see a lot of our comrades that, um, you know, were part of movements, um, leading organizations or being just very outspoken activists now being part of government. And with that, seeing like new policies that are presented um, you know, to people to vote on or or things that are just like made uh, law. Uh, so, you know, like I think we can talk about the climate justice agenda that the government has because as you were, you know, pointing out at the, at the beginning, James, this is not the same socialist movement that we saw a couple of, you know, decades ago. This is a socialist movement that, socialist movement that understands the big challenges that we have 
not just as a region, but 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 as you know, uh, communities around the world. And I think, of course, they couldn't do it alone. But you know, what we see here is a front again uh, of Latin American governments that have a very very broad, radical, bold vision for systemic change. So yeah, we can talk about it um, a bit more in a moment. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Tatiana. Um, and I. I definitely have some questions, but I think maybe we should go to Cassia first. Um, and, you know, there's, because I mean, there's obviously some um, some parallels that, I mean, I guess the, the question of political space is very important here, like the possibility of, of opening up new, I mean, Brazil is the biggest country in Latin America. It's, you know, and what happens in Brazil is is, is absolutely important to what happens in in the whole um hemisphere so um yeah do you want to just i mean we're in a situation now right where we lula has won the first round um you know more or less with the percentage that the polls were predicting but bolsonaro has done quite a lot better than than the polls were predicting um and this is another theme that i think we should come to in terms of of the the enduring nature of this of this this far right um that we're seeing, populist far right that we're seeing right around the world um despite how terrible <laughs> bolsonaro's government has been in terms of covid and and all sorts of things um so yeah how is it how is it in Brazil now? And um, you know, how are how are people, you know, what's the what's the background? So hello, comrades. Hi James. I'm very honored to be here with uh two other women, Tatiana and Yasna. I think that's very symbolic as well. And good evening to everybody who is following us. I think most of you are in Europe, so it's good evening. Um, I would like, first of all, to congratulate the people of Chile and the people of Colombia for uh, their achievements uh, in, in these last elections. Uh, I think it's very important for everybody to understand the symbolism that it is for Latin America to have a left-wing government in places like Colombia and Chile which used to be the main allies of US in Latin America. So it's very symbolic uh, for the whole continent to have today left-wing governments in those two countries. So uh, I really congratulate the people of uh, Chile and, and, and Colombia uh, through Tatiana and, and Yasna. Uh, well, how... How is the situation in Brazil now, just after the first round of the elections? Uh, just a very brief background. Uh, like uh, you, you must have been following, but uh, I have, I, I may say that the Brazilian disgrace started in 2015 uh, with the whole campaign against the labor parties and Dilma Rousseff's government, and then the parliamentary coup that impeached uh, Dilma Rousseff in 2016, and then Lula's imprisonment, and then later on Bolsonaro's election in 2018. Um, so this, I mean, what we see today in Brazil must, uh, must be viewed by the whole process that started in 2015. The criminalization of the left by the media uh, the, the mistakes made by the Labour Party uh, during those 12 years of government as well. Um, the way that the, the extreme right, especially uh, driven by the fundamentalist uh, religious, uh, sounds familiar, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, were had so much uh, influence over the working class in Brazil. So all of this, uh, uh, we need to see how we are today in Brazil uh, through the eyes of uh, historical eyes, let's say. 
Uh, so as James said, even with the disaster that was Bolsonaro's government since 2019. So this, it's, it's an extreme right in terms of values and politics, but also ultra neoliberal in economic terms. It's a racist, misogynistic. That's how you say that in English. Uh, James, can you correct yes. me? Yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, government. Uh, we, I mean, we had a step back in many of the achievements that we had had from the previous decades. Uh, dismantled of the labor law, environmental law, agrarian reform law, a discourse of hate against women, black people, indigenous, LGBT. The, I mean, the government. Um, no management of the, the pandemic. So apart from all of this, is still in the first round, as James said, Bolsonaro had 43% of the votes against 48% of Lula's uh, votes. Of course, I mean, it's not something to discourage uh, the left. I mean, we are very hopeful that we are going to win in the second round, but that give us a message and a very important message that we need to be able to read. I mean, it's 43% of the Brazilian population that even after four years of this government is still voted on Bolsonaro. And I think this is something that the left wing, the people's movement in Brazil must be able to read because we're talking about the, a very large percentage of the working class. We're not talking only about the elites. We're talking about the large percentage of the working class who are still voting for Bolsonaro. Um, and just for you uh, guys to understand a little bit uh, the situation uh, after this first round, in terms of number, very quickly, uh, James. So 43% of the votes for Bolsonaro against 48 for Lula. Okay, Lula is winning. But when it comes to the state government, Bolsonaro's candidates uh, won in the first round in two of the major capitals of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro and Minas Gerais, which is also the largest electoral uh, colleges along with Sao Paulo, right? In terms of the parliament, uh, the Bolsonaro's party won 23 seats more. So today uh, in total, Bolsonaro's parties have 99 seats in parliament against 80 seats from the federation that brings together Labour Party, Green Party, and Communist Party of Brazil. So they are winning in, in, in the parliament as well. And that's the same situation in the Senate. So even with Lula's victory in the second round, the whole parliamentary um, uh, the way the parla parliament is now, the composition of the parliament is going to make Lula's life very difficult. Um, one thing uh, that I think I would like to say, and I'm going to leave it now because I think we have more time. I want to have more time for questions and maybe uh, after all, after that, to discuss a little bit about the challenges of uh, uh, a possible <laughs> Lula's government. But one of the things that MST, as a, I would say the largest people's movement in Brazil have learned from the previous pink tide, as James have called it, uh, and that I think is a, uh, a strong lesson for all the progressive governments now in Latin America, is that um, we have a very strong extreme right in the continent. And this is not only a wave. I mean, uh, that's why we say to defeat Bolsonaro in the elections does not mean to defeat the political project that Bolsonaro symbolizes. And that's the same for every country in Latin America. So uh, even with a progressive government, all the progressive governments in Latin America are going to be governments under dispute without people's mobilization 
to be able, one, to defend this government against coups from the extreme right, but second, to push those governments to the left. I mean, uh, the elections on its own are, are not going to be able to achieve too much in the correlations of force that we have in the continent today. So that's why the situation in Chile and in Colombia is a bit different than in Brazil because the elections were followed. I mean, the, the you guys had a very strong people's mobilization that led to the victory of the left, right? So the people in the streets were the main uh, reason for uh, an electoral victory. We didn't have that in Brazil. I mean, people in Brazil is like, since 2015, it seems that the people in Brazil is just like it's apathic. It's like, you know, we didn't have this wave of people's mobilization in the country. And that's why we have um, as uh, MST during this last year, before the election, we have been putting a lot of effort in building what we are calling the people's committees, which are organizing people in their own territories in the countryside, but as well as in the cities. For uh, one, to of course defeat Bolsonaro in the election, but also to build a way of people's participation that may lead to a better uh, mobilization to make this government what it should be. And I think I'm gonna leave it uh, here, uh, James, because we are very, very advanced in time, so that maybe you have time for some questions and discussions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Cassie. That was really um, interesting and a, a useful kind of um, insight into the into the situation in Brazil. Um, so we, we've not got a huge amount of questions yet. So I, just to oh, there's one one or two more here now. Um, so um so yeah there's one so there's a question here actually about the rise of evangelical christianity in brazil and the support base that that gives to bolsonaro and i suspect that's quite a similar theme uh in other countries in latin america i mean just to say you know in chile it was just as as boric wasn't coming from the traditional kind of center left neither was his opponent cast coming from the traditional sort of right um you know he, he was a, a a populist in the mold of bolsonaro right um and thank goodness defeated but still presumably that is present and and presumably was also part of the defeat of the constitution in some way as well the the mobilization that um he'd managed in that election so um yeah, I mean, what do, does anybody want to address the, the question of, of, I suppose, a bit more on the on the on the right and also evangelical Christianity and the, the links there? I mean, that's that's the case in Brazil, right, Cassian? Yes, it's definitely the case in Brazil. Uh, we we cannot as 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 we say, we need to look at the conjunctural situation. Uh, through the historical process, we cannot uh, forget that the, the fundamentalist neo-Pentecostal religions were brought to the to Latin America uh, in the '60s by the U.S. to confront the theology of liberation, which was very strong in the continent at that time. There was a, a strategy from the U.S. to confront the, the, the liberation theology in the continent, they brought many uh, of those, uh, I don't know if the name is priests, pastors, uh, of those very uh, radical and fundamentalist religions. So Bolsonaro today, if you look at uh, what is the social base of Bolsonaro, what is, what, um, Bolsonaro is backed basically by those fundamentalist uh, religious and the military. The Bolsonaro's government had more military people in the government than the, the military dictatorship in Brazil had. So the militaries got the power again 
during Bolsonaro's government, even though it wasn't officially a uh, military government. So yeah, it's true. I mean, the thing is, um, we are talking about working class. I mean, most of those uh, people following uh, the more, funda most, more fundamentalist uh, Christian religions in Brazil, they are working class. So we need to look at ourselves as right, as, as left, sorry. <laughs> What went wrong? I mean, how? Why can? Why the, those religions appeal to these people, to the working class today, much more than uh, the left does? So this is something that we can. We need also to look into ourselves to to answer that. Thank you. Yes, do you want to jump in? Yes, no, did you did you have did you want to say something? Yeah, um, something about Cassia said uh, that the, the stream right, for example, in here we we have um, in this uh, defeat uh, in this law of the the new constitution uh, the the stream right uh, try to put their agenda. Uh, uh, they assume like uh, they want, for example, the the common sense, and not just the the uh, the, the vote this uh, past voting. Uh, and this uh, this is a, a, um, a threat we have. Uh, our government uh, turn for the center, for example, uh, brings uh, some past uh, politician like um, Karina Toa. Uh, that she is of the center of uh, the polit um, politic uh, political uh, party called uh, PPD, uh, Party of uh, by the Democracy. Uh, and they're if, uh, at the center, they are the center. And another of a PS party, a socialist par, a part, they are the center of uh, their, um, they have a government and, and, and uh, before government. So uh, because of the threat on the extreme right, uh, assume that the refuse the new constitution is a one for this size, they try to put uh, their agenda in all of the the, the sense uh, for a say, uh, and we have a uh, for example caste is a big, uh, huge um, threat, but also another politician of a, a Republican a party. You have a new Republican party here, political party here, Republicans. They are really a threat in in different levels. A threat, for example. A, even today, uh, for example, uh, the Republican uh, political party says that a transsexual uh, uh, woman uh, of my my political party, for example, uh, can fight for the sexual and reproduction rights for the women and not uh, all people because uh, she can, for example, uh, do an abort or practice abort because. Uh, he can biological, he can't biological uh, aborting. Uh, this is the type of comment. I don't know if you, you understand, maybe I don't express very well, but uh, he says that she uh, can fight for the uh, repro uh, sexual rights because uh, she, for him, is not an actual a woman. Mm. Uh, and that's happened uh, that the stream uh, right um, take this uh, defeat, uh, take this, uh, the, the laws of the, the process of constitution, like they can push their own agenda uh, to um, go back to another uh, stuff, another politic. Uh, and we already don't, uh, uh, we uh, can see, for example, uh, the power, uh, they have a, uh, uh, um, Evangelical and Catholic religions. I I I agree with Kesia because in the in the regions, not in the capital, in the regions, they have a really strong uh, link with the workers uh, class. Uh, class um, in the in the south and the north, uh, they all refuse. Uh, there's new constitution. They have, for example, a plurinationality. Uh, they have um, uh, a the capability to abort like a, a constitutional rights. All of that idea um, 
was refused by all these extreme right uh, vinculated with the uh, evangelical uh, religion in the south and in the north. And another big problem uh, and the, um, that use uh, the extreme right uh, to push their own agenda is the uh, migratory crisis. And the, in all Latin America, we have a, a crisis of politics of migration. But here uh, they call it a, a migration a crisis, uh, like uh, the people is uh, illegal, but we don't say that. <laughs> the, the left, we said, is a irregular uh, condition, for example, of migration. But they say um, uh, we cannot admit, for example, uh, a new migratory uh, a crisis uh, for for our country and there um, and there is a big problem we have in all of the latin america countries too um, how we front uh, the big threat of uh, extreme right uh, when they use the uh, crisis of political of migration uh, against uh, the left and they link, for example, when uh, insecurity uh, on our countries, when the insecurity is a, is a very uh, wide problem with different causes uh, uh, and not just a migratory, uh, uh, not just the, migra the, the migration, for, for a say. So there, we have a, a, a new party, it's a really a, a threat for our government. Well, if I could just move on to something, uh, um, well, one, because I want to make sure we get this in and also to, to be a bit more hopeful um, mm -hmm. is, I mean, you mentioned, Cassia, the, uh, you know, that the, the, the Bolsonaro's government has been a really misogynistic government. And, um, but also the other side of this is actually, there's been really quite quite mass movements across Latin America, feminist mass movements across Latin America in recent years, particularly younger women, um, first of all, fighting violence against women and femicides, and then also for the right to abortion, particularly in Argentina, where we saw that struggle over several years that eventually um, won um, the right to abortion, at least within the first 12 weeks, presumably then having an impact in Colombia, where actually it was a constitutional court ruling that that um, uh, opened up the right to abortion. But you can't really see that having happened without the struggle that happened in, in Argentina and other places in the continent. So I, I wanted to kind of raise that and maybe ask what the role of feminism has been in this new left a little bit. It, you know, Yasna, you said this was you, you know, the, the Boric's government has declared itself a, a, a feminist government. Um, you know, what's, uh, I don't know, Tatiana, what's the situation in, in Colombia um, uh, around, around feminism? And Thank you. Yes, and this is what I wanted to come back to, actually. Um, so, you know, like the narratives that emerge from various local social movements, um, as I was saying, like the national strikes last year and the global feminist uh, atom, I think, of collective joy that we have also seen really, really strongly coming through Latin America, I think was, you know, the what really gave space to, uh, to this election. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of things that, you know, that we saw very, very clearly um, in this election. For instance, the idea or the framework of El Buen Vivir or good living that I think many movements around the world, you know, have used and kind of like adopted. Um, and the other one that we saw like very, very coming through very strongly was the hasta que la dignidad se haga costumbre until dignity becomes practice. Uh, which also emphasizes this idea of enjoying life, living with dignity and making joy um, or joyful resistance a practice of ourselves and communities. That is stuff that movements in Chile have been talking about. Uh, 
that you know that we have seen like in different moments across the the continent and that you know here in the space of of Colombia have come back again in the you know like in the kind of like a space of the election and allowed for like the imaginaries of people to really be expanded and for people to say, okay, we have the far right talking about migration as a threat and talking about, you know, like uh, abortion as a threat and all of these things, but actually there are other ways of, of talking about these things that are more, you know, um, give us more space to live like dignified uh, lives. So, yeah, like I wanted to, to come back to that because I also saw a question about like, what are the messages that worked uh, in this election? And I think it's important for, you know, the left everywhere to understand, you know, that, I don't know, like in the UK, I know if a lot of people are joining here, we might still feel like really sad about the the loss of the 2019 election when we had a different kind of like, you know, Labour Party with a different and more radical, you know, manifesto. And, you know, like, I guess like my point is that we shouldn't like stop dreaming and talking about the things that we talk about in the left in the way that we do, because it takes time. But like, I feel that like people, um, I mean, the, through education programs like the ones of uh, Global Justice Now and others, like political education programs, we, we we can start to understand what that really means in like the practical, for our practical lives, um, you know, if you come from a working class background or whatever. So yeah, like I think um, the feminist movement, just to go back to your question here in Colombia is, you know, quite strong at the moment. Um, and I think like at the moment, it feels like all movements in a way are strong in Colombia because there is the space, uh, you know, that the government allows in a way. I mean, they were active and really powerful before, but I think there's like more space for all of us to have like more conversations about the kinds of things that that we need for ourselves and, uh, and each other. So yeah, like, um, yeah, and I guess um, the, yeah, like all of these kind of like calls for living with dignity and, uh, and, and good life and good living, you know, are things that stay with people in our sites. And I hope that like, you know, they, they can become, they can continue to sort of like be socialized by, by people and popularized so that we can have sustained, you know, uh, change, not just for this government, but for, for hopefully the, the, the governments to come. So yeah, just wanted to kind of like come with, uh, with a bit of hope that things can be possible and that our narratives, you know, are good and that we should keep organizing with those ideas in mind. Um, does anybody else want to come in on the Uh, I think, uh, oh, very briefly, uh, James, just um, actually uh, looking at the questions, I think two things that I would like, to, three things that I would like to say. Mm -hmm. First, sure, we need to end, end this webinar with our spirits <laughs> up, not low, <laughs> especially because we have a lot of struggle ahead of us, so we need to be uh, encouraged to face uh, that. So first of all, I'd like to say, in, despite uh, all the scenery that I, I, I presented uh, to you uh, after the first uh, round of the elections, we have to say that, for example, uh, we have elected the first transgender parliamentarian to the national parliament in the history of Brazil. We have elected the first indigenous leadership for the parliament of the state of Sao Paulo in the history of the state of Sao Paulo. We have elected, it's terrible to say, but the first black parliamentarian in the state, in the, in the state of Paraná, which is a very racist state in the history of Paraná. We have elected seven militants of MST for the state parliaments and national parliaments. So there is still a lot of, there is a lot of good things that resulted from this first round. Um, I think now our, our I mean, uh, what some, someone say, said in the chat uh, that Bolsonaro use uh, social media, how the left, if the left has learned 
uh, to use it as well. I mean, Bolsonaro used fake news. That's what he used. We don't want to learn that. <laughs> we need to find our own way to reach people. And our way is, has always been organizing the people in their territories, in their uh, place of work. And that's what we need to put our efforts for the second round. Not only to earn the elections, but to build social force uh, to be able to push forward the structural change that we need to have in this country. And we are very hopeful that we are going to be uh, victorious. And lastly, I think uh, Tatiana, Yasna, uh, we need to uh, take the advantage of this new red tide uh, in our continent to push our governments to advance in the regional uh, integration. I mean, isolated, it's very difficult for us to defeat the right wing in our own countries, but also to confront imperialism in our uh, continent. So regional integration, and I think now we do have in the continent a very good um, uh, scene, political uh, scene to be able to advance in the um, regional uh, integration. And that I think that it's something that our, we, our people must put pressure on under our new governments to advance on that. Thank you, James. I don't know if I spoke about what you wanted me to speak, but I just I was just reading the, the, the questions in the chat, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's, that's, that's really uh, great. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, Yasna, did you have anything to say on, anything on the, the, the feminism, particularly the feminism question and that relationship there or? Yeah, um, the feminist movement is very strong here in our country. Um, very um, um, intersectional uh, stuff, for example, the um, Anti, uh, the, the um, anti racism feminists, anti extractivism feminists, uh, trans uh, include feminine uh, feminists, um, that all have uh, this construct by, by the years, but we have a very strong movement here. Um, also, the, the feminists, uh, we moved uh, previously uh, of in campaign of a body uh, against the, the spread of caste, for example, that mean uh, uh, an. an uh, a loss, for example, very of uh, our wins, uh, like uh, three causes award here, we have a lot of that, uh, three causes uh, in cast, uh, if uh, we'll be elect, for example, we know that uh, the, the, we won, uh, we maybe lose that win, for example. So here in, in our country, we have a, a very um, a strong movement, a feminist movement, um, in also the the project uh, of while uh, the Frente Amplio, for example, is main of that. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of um, a politician figure, uh, figures and uh, they also declare feminists like uh, Boric uh, himself. Um, I, I, I want to ask uh, some questions they have in the, in the message, for example, mm -hmm. a lesson to reach more people. Uh, I think in this process, uh, one of the, the, the great lessons uh, we have is the media law. And we need in uh, media law um, because we know that the fake news, um, uh, even in the, in the um, national television uh, and um, the big um, big uh, papers, newspapers, and uh, they replicate that fake news. So we need and think uh, all of country uh, need a, a media law uh, who restricts, for example, the use of uh, social media or um, have a more uh, capacity to the uh, community media, the, the more uh, the small media uh, to say it, uh, this other perspective. I think one of the great lessons too is um, remember of Gramsci, for example, Gramsci uh, said three, three things uh, in, in the praxis, uh, right? The education, 
their religion and media. <laughs> uh, we have an education and the student movement. Uh, the religion, we, we really don't, don't think about of that, but uh, they're our mistake too, uh, because in, in region have a, a lot of power of and the, the common sense in, in general. Um, third, the media. We already lose, uh, lo um, forgot what the media is important for, for not just for um, the, the ah, campaign, uh, that also in constant, uh, um, um, uh, they are thinking how they uh, come to the people. I, I don't know how to say how we um, learn uh, and hear constantly the this new idea. Uh, we have we we need uh, media for 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 this other side of view uh, for this other. A type of uh, politic uh, we knew uh, the, the people know, um, and the other uh, stuff I want to say, uh, but good stuff. Uh, we already have a roadmap. We when the new constitution uh, wrote about the, the the conventionals, we have uh, this roadmap for the um, uh, nature rights uh, for uh, plurinationality uh, to recognize the different nation of in our country. Uh, we have this roadmap is uh, one of the base of construct the future. We don't uh, uh, step back uh, even a one step. No, it's not uh, accepted for us. Uh, just uh, it all, todo lo contrario. I don't know how to say in English. Uh, maybe Tatiana can help me. How to say uh, todo lo contrario? <laughs> like the opposite. Yeah, yeah. The opposite. We we have this uh, roadmap for construct the the future, uh, uh, an agenda of climate change. Uh, 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 is is um, profundized. I don't know how to say it even uh, for for the next generation. That I I want to say. <laughs> Thank you, Piazna. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, can I just very, very quickly before we end, um, Tatiana, come back to the question of um, climate change, actually, and because the, you know, there was um, uh, in the election. Um, um, I've forgotten his name now. <laughs> um, yeah, um, he talked. To, he talked about ending the era of fossil fuels, right? So how how likely is that you know like what what are the you know that's of course it's it's fantastic that somebody's actually recognizing that's what needs to happen but then there's the reality so you know it seems like there's a lot of momentum at the moment in colombia but like what how far can that that take us oh i think we can all agree that to transition to something else uh will take you know a bit of time but also not just the effort of a country but like regions and like you know wider kind of like uh yeah like i guess territories countries uh but i think what this government is doing is doing it little by little and um i mean i just it's really nice to see, for instance, how in their uh, political campaign that they ran uh, uh, earlier this year, they talked about like looking after the larger territory. So like, you know, understanding like the importance of not just looking, you know, for this little kind of like place where we are, but like to understanding Colombia and the region and the world as, you know, an ecosystem. Uh, so I think, you know, first of all, I just want to emphasize the importance of like narratives because that, you know, that those narratives is what then kind of like lead to a bit, uh, for them to be able to like make changes. But in particular, um, they have committed to protecting the Amazon rainforest uh, and, uh, and crafting a national and regional just transition, transition towards a regenerative economy where um, the bedrock of the was where the bedrock of the campaign and we are seeing like you know every week I think they've been in power since September and every week we see news coming up about like you know changes that they, they want they want to do around energy changes that they want to do around the price of oil 
you know, uh, treaties that they want to join. So, you know, what we see is like a political, you know, political will uh, from coming from the government to actually, trans, you know, transition into something else. Um, so, I mean, if you ask me if we, you know, I think it is, you know, um, it is very likely that we that we change the ways in which we relate to you know the exploitation and extraction of fossil uh, fuels, for instance, in the coming years. But as I said, this is not a response that could only come from Colombia, but it will have to be a response you know from from the region. And one of the first things that Petro and, and Marcia also said when they were elected was that. Uh, well, they kind of like called upon other lefty, left wing governments uh, and leaders to break, um, you know, with this thinking of the first being tight uh, of like the socialist socialist movements in Latin America. And so I think what we see is an interest for like, you know, working with other people to be able to transition onto something else. So, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say like it is perfect and they're going to change everything in four years because I think you know, it will take more than that. But what I'm seeing uh, here is like a, a, a strong political will and interest to work in, you know, also with, with countries are, uh, in Latin America to change in and to starting to do that. So yeah, let's see what happens in the coming months. But as you and many others, um, I'm feeling really inspired about the things that they have proposed, the visions that they have for these four years in government. And, and yeah, and hopefully it will be something that, uh, benefits Colombians, but also like the region as a whole. Um, yeah, that's what I'm seeing. And, and hopefully even the rest of the world. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a great note to finish on. We, we are going to have to finish now. Um, I, thank you so much, all three of you. That was really, really interesting. Um, I have, there was somebody talking about using social media in the chat there and I, I know for one that the, um, the MST have got a very active Instagram account. I've put the uh, I've put the account um, in just a, it's, it's disappearing now up the chat. But um, uh, even if you don't speak Portuguese, you get the sense. So do give it a follow if you're on Instagram. Um, Global Justice Now is also on Instagram, as we are, of course, on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, we, like I said at the beginning, have groups around the country and also a youth network um, and if anybody is um, uh, under 30 would like to get involved with our youth network um, we've actually got a welcome call tomorrow um, so um, if you if that if you don't have the details of that and you would look like to um, get involved in some way, um, then just drop us an email. Um, and there we go. Daisy's popped that in the chat as well. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope to see you again on a future webinar or in person at one of our events. Thank you very much. Adios. Thank you, Cassia. Thank you, thank you Cassia. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you and Lula on October yeah. 30th. Yes. <laughs> yes. Everything yes, crossed. Yes, we crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.